And welcome everybody to this officials education session that's called World Athletics 2022-2023 Rules Update. It's been organised by the New South Wales Joint Officials Committee. My name's Darren Wenzer. I'm the Head of Coach and Volunteer Development with Little Athletics New South Wales. I acknowledge that we've also got Mary Macaluso, the um, Athletics New South Wales Workforce Coordinator here on the uh, at the meeting tonight and also Daniel Warren who is the Little Athletics New South Wales um, volunteer manager and business analyst. Um, of course, we've also got our presenters, Barry Pecker and John Morris, who I'm going to pass over to in a moment to take us through this, this presentation. Uh, before we do, look, we've got people spread far and wide tonight. This is a, like a national type webinar. I think most of the states and territories are represented here this evening. So, so, so thank you for, for being here. And look, I would like to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all situated today. I'm here in North Parramatta, which is traditional Darug land. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us here today. Now, um, on to the presentation, the World Athletics 2022-2023 rules update. And I'm going to pass over to, I think, Barry Pekar first to start us on that presentation. Thanks for that, Barry. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Darren. Um, yeah, what we're going to do tonight is just go through some of the rule changes that have been made for um, the World Athletics this year. Um, we are not going to do anything with the uh, World Para Athletes because they haven't come through with their book, but their changes yet but a lot of their uh, rules will be um, ones that are in line with what it, we will talk about tonight. So there'll be certain um, differences, but uh, most of them, they are trying to run the same thing so that all athletes are on the same page as far as the rules are concerned. So we can go a little bit further, Darren. Okay, just so that you know, any, any uh, normal black uh, printing will be just the rule text as, as it existed in the last book. If you see bold black, we're going, that's what's been added to this new book when, you, when and if we get it. Um, and the other part that you'll see uh, bold and italics, that's the interpretation notes. Now, a lot of you would know about the referee. Well, this is the green part of your book so we've called them the interpretation notes and they're the ones that the rules are up the top and then there's an interpretation explaining what that can mean. So that's it. And if we've got personal ob observations or explanations, it's in that print. So that's the way we're going to go through it and you'll see uh, that throughout the presentation. Thanks, Darren. Okay, so competition rules first up. As you know, it's separated into competition and uh, technical rules. So we'll start talking about some of the competition rule changes. So the, one of, one of the, the things that's changed is um, that they are now referring to the running and walks, walk, a race walking events referee. So basically the track referee um, to cover all areas in the in the new book is that they are a running and race walking events referee. So that covers then all the out of stadium referees and all the track referees. So the basic one is that um, the start referee has jurisdiction to decide any facts related to the start. And if they do not agree with the decisions of the start team, except in the cases when it in it regards an apparent false start indicated by the SIS system, unless for any reason the referee determines that the information provided by the system is obviously inaccurate. So that's that's very clear. And it's basically to be more explicit. And it's also meant that they have a um, amended the track of uh, the technical rule 8.4.1, which we'll talk about later. And for practicality, if there's no start referee appointed, the track referee could give this duty to the start area coordinator for any events not started at the start finish line. So for instance, 
100 metres, 200 metres, the start area coordinator can, uh, the track referee can say to the start area coordinator, you will be the start referee. Okay, um, the next one is the referee. They just changed that rule 54.7.6 because they got the wrong number in the last book. So this is the rule about warning and exclusion from the competition. So that one was 54, uh, I think it was in the old book, it was 54.7.3. Now it's, it, they've amended that to be the right rule so that you've got, you can quote the right rule if there's a problem. And just to show you what those, those are, um, the, we've just listed there all the uh, different rules that are mentioned up above and what they mean. So 16.5, for instance, is the start, and that's the um, uh, full start rule. And so it goes through. So you can read those or have a look at those as you go. But the one that's been changed, as I said, is leaving the course when disqualified. So basically that's just making sure that when a referee or um, an official tells you to leave the course, you actually do it. And therefore, if you don't, there are implications in further rules. Okay, judges. So the chief judge for running or race walking events and chief judge for each field event shall coordinate the work of the judges in their respective events. If the duties of the judges have not been allocated in advance, they shall allocate the duties. So basically, as we've said here, that's basically to say that it allows people like the meeting managers and the chief track umpire and the start uh, area coordinator to actually make rosters and allocate the duties of their teams. Up to this point in time, it hasn't been clearly stated in the rules that they have that um, authority before the event. And the appropriate judge shall normally indicate the validity of non-validity of an, a trial by raising the red or white flag as appropriate and alternate visual indications may also be approved. Now, uh, we have a number of people in our sport who have a, a number of different ways of showing that. So, Consequently, at the national championships in 2020, we had the technical officials decide that they needed to judge the ability of the uh, track umpire team walking onto the field of play when they were doing the 100 metres. So this is what we got. I don't think that's the way it was meant to, uh, the judging was meant to be, but that was that was what the uh, the uh, uh, the technical team thought of our our efforts. Thanks. All right, John, do you want to go on? Okay, thanks, Barry. <clears throat> okay, the TIC, the uh, competition secretary or the directorate. So, with the uh, addition of the new track rule about treading on the line, which we'll talk about shortly. Rule 25.4, it's adding added symbol to list, added symbol to list of symbols to be used. So the track infringement, which is the uh, new rule, 17.4.3 and 17.4.4 for the technical rules, this is the introduction of the letter L. So with regards to that, this symbol is used in races where there are subsequent rounds of an event and only in results where there is a further round to be held and never in the result of a final round. The letter L should not be used in races where the event is conducted in a single round or in combined events where the rule does not apply. So what we're looking at there is when uh, the referee indicates to the uh, competition director that uh, somebody has infringed in a round leading up to the final, the appropriate uh, symbol is the L which should go onto the start list for the next race and that will uh, obviously the referee will get a copy of the start list and uh, if there are any infringements against that athlete and the L is there well obviously it, it's a matter of talking to the athlete at the end of the competition once the referee has received any notifications of rule infringements for the umpire 
and speak to the athlete to let him know that, or her, that there'll be a disqualification. So there's only one chance at this, and uh, it, the, the L carries on, as I've said, to the subsequent rounds. So an athlete shall be regarded as DNS if, A, after their name having been included on the start list for any event, they do not report to the call room for that event. B, having passed through the call room, they may not make any, they do not make any attempt in the field event, or they do not attempt to make a start in a running or race walking event. Or the final one is rule 39.10 of the rules, which is applies to combined events. Any athlete failing to attempt to start or make a trial in one of the events shall not be allowed to take part in subsequent events, but shall be considered to have abandoned the competition. And obviously that, need, that information needs to be passed on. They shall not therefore figure in the final cl uh, classification. Any athlete deciding to withdraw from the competition shall immediately uh, pass that information on to the combined events referee. This one, all we've done is draw your attention to it. An update of the rules regarding doping control and ra the ratification of rules. They're, they're new, new rules, but uh, we're not going to go into those in this presentation. John, we do have a question back to the L. Yep. Sure. Um, it's just, does the, I think you answered this potentially, but just double check in the L, will that carry through to all subsequent rounds? So if it started in a heat, would it be in the semi final and the final or just in the round? after where the infringement was? No, it will carry through right, right through the end of competition. However, if it happens in 100 metres, it doesn't carry through to the 200 metres if the athlete is competing in that event. It's only for that specific event. Yeah, beautiful. Right. Okay, so Darren, comp competition rule 32. Uh, for which the world record is recognised. So this rule details what world records will be recognised and the three accepted ways of timing are fully automatic timing, hand time performance and transponder time performances. So again, in those rules, it's, it's specified. And the new events that have been added to the list under these three headings are the race walking track, 35,000 metres, the road race, 50 kilometres, and the walking race, 35 kilometres. So now we go to the technical rules. So these are the ones I suppose are more important for a competition on the track and in the field, of course. So if we look at clothing, shoes, and athletic bib, this rule 5.2 has experienced a major rewrite due to the ongoing nature of the improvements in shoe design. This has been, uh, as, as I've indicated there, this has been a concern over a number of um, months and then it developed into years. So a major statement was released by World Athletics on the 22nd of December, 2021, and effective from January, 2022. And the document can be found on the World Athletics website, Technical Rule 2.0. 1A. So the following definition will provide some guidance as to the application of the new rule. A definition of applicable competitions to make the scope of events, the rule and regulations apply to clear and to avoid them being applied to amateur sport, amateur clubs, school and college, or even master level events. So to be proactive, Athletic Australia also distributed a protocol document, as I've indicated there, in relation to the application of this rule in 2022 of January. In a nutshell, there's a requirement by under 20 and open athletes to declare their shoe type at national championships, both summer and winter, for the, because this is important for the purposes of records and qualifications for events at a higher level, such as the Olympics, the Commonwealth Games, and the World Championship. So it's those two uh, age groups is the major concern that uh, the uh, World Athletics and Athletics Australia are following through. 
So this is just an outline again, if you read that document, I've just taken that from appendix three, and this uh, continues until the 31st of the 10th, 2024, obviously about the time of the uh, Paris Olympics. And there are the, the, the various events, they're the uh, maximum and thickness of the sole as per the regulations and a further explanation as to what's required. So if we continue in this rule, if a, if a track manufacturer or a stadium operator mandates a lesser minimum or prohibits the use of a certain shaped spike, this shall be applied and the athlete notified of this accordingly. So expanding on this rule, expansion of the legalities of the rule between 5.2 through to 5.6 is dealt with in a separate document located on the World Athletic site, which I've referred to. In support of the above shoe rules, the World Athletic Shoe Compliance List, published fortnightly, details shoe appropriateness for, eat, for use on the track up to 800 metres and then above 800 metres, all field events with the exception of the triple jump, road, cross country and finally any development shoes because as we know, developing shoes are still fluid and they're currently of course there'll be more shoes being developed and be put up for scrutiny before World Athletics so they can be added to the list. So shoe makes and models are listed with a yes or a no indicating their suitability from the above list. So if you haven't had a look at this, what we've done is we've uh, just put an example and an example of the list and it can be located on the World Athletics website. Uh, when you go onto it under the top right hand corner, you'll find diary. I'll just wait for the uh, for the chat box to uh, close down so I can read the rest of it. Well, it was just in regards to the PowerPoint presentation, but I think we're going to make that available online on Friday anyway. Sure. Okay. Uh, Mary's responded to that. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Daniel, for uh, coming in and clarifying that for the person that asked the question. So an example of the shoe list is found on the next slide. So this is just an example. <clears throat> so what it is, there's spike shoes there, and it talks about all the different brands, the models, and then whether they're suitable for events up to 800 metres, uh, 800 metres and, and beyond, and then the various field events, the road, the cross country, etc. And there you can see that um, down there, Puma develop, uh, in the stage of uh, developing a new shoe, which they're uh, taking a, a year by looking at that to try and develop that shoe. So as I said, that changes every two weeks. So for athletes to make sure that their shoe is legal, that's what they need to refer to. And just to give you, just to give you an example of that, there is the decathlon shoe for Kiprum who's one of, the, one of the athletes, and he could have that shoe from the 31st, uh, 30th of the first 22 to 29th of the first 23 as the only person to wear that shoe because officially it's in development. So then after that, after the 29th of January next year, the manufacturers have to decide whether they're going to continue with it or and and put it on the open market or withdraw it. And as you can see, it's for road and cross country only. Mm. Okay, assistance to athletes, Barry. All right, for the purpose of this rule, the following examples shall be considered assistance and that and are therefore not allowed. You can't use a mechanical aid unless on the balance of probabilities the use of that aid would not provide them with an overall competitive advantage over an athlete using such an aid. So that's what, what goes with that. And this was the, the uh, decision of the Court of Arbitration of Sport, and they insisted that that provision be put into our rules because there was a, a case uh, about using a particular aid that one of the athletes wanted to, to make and said there was nothing in the rules that that said that they could, could or could not use it, so that uh, the uh, arbit court of arbitration for sport turned around and said, you have to make a uh, rule that will clarify 
this so that they don't come back to us. All right, effective disqualification. Um, 18.5, as we know, is the competition rule for the referee's decision on disqualifications. And they should be disqualified from the event. If the athlete's second warning occurs in a different event, they shall be disqualified from the second event. Such disqualification shall prevent an athlete from taking part in any further rounds. So basically, they get a yellow card. They've, it's recorded as first yellow card. They then go to another event and they misbehave again and they will be given a second yellow card because on the uh, start sheet of that event, and it doesn't matter whether it's track or field, uh, they should have beside their name yellow one. And if they have a yellow two, the, the referee will show the yellow card to the athlete and immediately show them the red card and that means that they're out of the whole competition. So they can't take part and realize they can't take part in anything else in that, in that particular competition. So if it was state championships, they'd be out of that state championships, even if it was the first day of competition. Okay, so they've added this rule regarding relays so that they, they can, uh, they again, clarify it, it a bit. So, however, if the behaviour of one or more of such individual athletes is considered serious enough, you can use Rule 18.5 of the competition rules uh, to, uh, to them, to those particular athletes, with the same applicable consequences. So that's the, the, the important one that the rule, relay rules now go that um, we can take out a athlete who's acting in an unsportsmanlike uh, way and um, that allows, allows us now to have that rule in there for the relays as well as individual events. Okay, protests. Again, this one's the, the, as you can see, I mentioned 8.4.1, um, but this deals with an oral protest at the start. So if an athlete makes an oral protest, an immediate oral protest against having been charged for a false start, the start referee, or if none, one's not appointed, the re relevant running or, or race walking events referee may, if they are any a doubt, in any doubt, allow the athlete to complete to compete under protest in order to preserve the rights of all concerned. Competing under protest shall not be allowed if the false start was indicated by the CIS system, unless for, for any reason the referee determines that the information provided by the system is obviously inaccurate. So for instance, you're not going to have a situation where we're going to have people arguing at the start. And if you remember the, the, uh, the Tokyo Olympics, when it was raining 400 metres, um, Brian Rowe let an athlete start under protest because, as he said when we were talking to him, I didn't want the athletes standing out there getting cold. So he let them run on the basis that we will deal with this later. And when they dealt with it and looked into it, the athlete was then uh, disqualified from the event. But you look at that so that you don't hold up the program. And if you feel that the best way to do it is to let them run under protest, they can run under, under protest, but you make sure they are aware that it's going to be dealt with at a later date. It's not going to be, oh, you've run under protest and you don't have to front and give us evidence why you shouldn't have been uh, disqualified in the first place. Okay. All right. Okay. You want to go to John? Okay, thanks, Barry. All right, so we're looking at the rule uh, protests and appeals. So if a protest or an appeal is based on an athlete's incorrect exclusion from an event due to a false start, and this is upheld after the completion of the race, then the athlete shall be afforded the opportunity to run on their own to record a time in the event and subsequently, if this is applicable, to be advanced to subsequent rounds. No athlete should be advanced to a subsequent round without competing in all rounds, except, uh, sorry, unless the jury or the ju uh, jury of appeal determines otherwise, in the particular circumstances of the case, and one of those is the shortness of time between each round. 
Uh, we had the classic example of this at the um, Rio Olympics with the women's uh, four by 100 uh, event in the when the Brazilians uh, obstructed the Americans and as a result they the Americans finished the race in a beta fide role they appealed to the referee and on their on the decision they ran again in their lane and they recorded a time that put them into the final and they won the won the event from lane one so this rule may also be applied by the referee the jury in other circumstances where it's been uh, appropriate. So when a protest is made by or on behalf of an athlete or team which did not finish the race, the referee must first ascertain whether the athlete or team was or shall have been disqualified for a breach of the rules unrelated to the matter raised in the protest. Should this be the case, the protest should be dismissed. So it's got to be in relation to something to do with the race. So uh, validity of performance, updated details concerning this topic range from TR 11.1 through to TR 11.4. So 11.2 commences with performances in events normally conducted in the stadium made outside traditional athletics facilities, such as those held on a temporary facility in a town square as a uh, they did for the Diamond League day one. They ran it around the, the uh, 5,000. They ran it around the town, down, town square in Zurich. And you can see the trams and the cars going by. They were running around. Or any other facilities, beaches, etc., Or on a temporary facility built within the stadium shall be recognised for all purposes. So I've got an, we've got an example here from the... Uh, from here, and uh, I've, or I've referred to the, uh, the town square opportunity where the athletes ran the five. So outside the stadium facility, this is day one of the Diamond League last year in Zurich. And you can see that this um, discus arrangement has been set up outside of the stadium. And you can tell that by the surrounds. And if, it, uh, if the specifications suit, uh, can uh, support the world athletics rules, that any uh, distances recorded here will be legal and will can, will can count. So this is something that I presume Seb Coe's fairly keen about from memory because I know that he likes to take the athletics to the community rather than always having the community come to athletics. So uh, we're all looking at the start now. So 16.10, the starter or any recaller who was of the opinion that a start was not a fair one shall recall the athletes by firing a gun or activated by suitable auditory signals. Again, the e-gun is not the only way now that um, we can uh, pull the athletes up if there's a full start. There, there are other lights and uh, associated audible uh, signals that, that can be used. And this change was made to reflect practices in that alternate methods are available and valid. So we're looking out the race. This one is the one that will contain, obviously, the, uh, the new rule concerning the foot, foot on the line. So if we start off with 17.2, the obstruction. If an athlete is jostled or obstructed during a race so as to impede their progress, then the World Athletics have now provided a definition of the word jostled. So for an, for an umpire, judging whether an athlete is being jostled. This is the definition that uh, we all need to apply. Jostling should be undertaken, sorry, it should be understood as physical contact with another athlete or athletes that results in an unfair advantage or serious injury or harm to them or consequently to another athlete or athlete. So the word obstruction now has been taken out and we use the word jostled and we, that's the uh, definition that we need to keep in mind when we're making any adjudication on what's occurring on the track. So this definition has prompted a change in the writing of the rule on the umpire infringement form. That's the one that we use that you, you can find on Oceania website and also on Athletics New South Wales, uh, sorry, Athletics Australia. Some of the other states have taken copies of it as well. The words pushed deliberately and accidentally have been taken out 
The umpire now reports the incident on the form and decides whether an advantage is gained or not by the reported athlete. And if the referee needs to find more information about that, they can talk to the chief umpire who can relate information back from the, the umpire who made the decision through the chief umpire to the referee. So again, this is what we had on the form previously. You can see the words there, pushed, obstructed or jostled, competed a number, so as to impede, compete, impede his or her progress, deliberate, accidental, we used to have to tick boxes, advantage, yes or no. Now in the uh, current uh, version, which is the uh, version which should read 12, 2021, it's obstructed or jostled the competitor, so as to impede their progress and advantage gained, yes or no. One of the biggest problems there was deciding uh, between people what deliberately or accidentally was. So you get situations where what I would consider deliberately and say what John would consider deliberately might be different. So they're trying to make sure that it is clear that it is whether they gained an advantage or not. And that was the important part. Through that, through that definition. Okay, so I'll start this one off and then I'll hand over to Barry. So the rule infringement. So rule 17.4, an athlete, or in the case of a relay race, their team shall not be disadvantaged, uh, disqualified if the athlete, 17.41, is pushed or forced by another athlete or object to keep, to step or run outside their lane or inside the curve or line marking the applicable border or... 17.42, steps or runs outside their lane in the straight, any straight part of the diversion from the track for the steeplechase water jump or outside the outer line of their lane on the bend. So that's basically the same rule it has been with the in, uh, in, uh, inclusion of this word object. And uh, that could be the, uh, the timing bell when you're at the ringing of the bell for the final lap, that could maybe fall into the path of the athletes and that could be a distraction. So it doesn't necessarily have to be another athlete. It could be something different. The, uh, the other one could be an advertising awning for argument's sake. So that, that's the, uh, the new interpretation of the rule, putting that word object. It's not just caused by a runner. So now we will start off by talking about the, the two that we're uh, concerned about, which is new. 17.4.3, in all races run in lanes, touches once the line on their left with the emphasis on once or the curb or line marking the applicable border as in defined by 17.3.2 of the technical rules on the bend or 17.44, in all races or any part of races not run in lane steps once on or completely over the curb or line marking the applicable boundary. Again, referring back to the definition of that rule on the bend. And no material advantage is gained and no other athlete being jostled or obstructed so as to impede the other athlete's progress. Again, referring back to that 17.2. And if material advantage is gained, the athlete or team shall be disqualified. So that's putting some meet to the, uh, to the rule about treading on the line. And again, we'll, we'll further to, uh, share with you some of the pictures that you've probably seen anyway of uh, what this really means. So in races, in multiple rounds, which I talked about when we talked about the L under technical information. So in races with multiple rounds using these rules, but to, uh, they may only once during all rounds of the event by a particular athlete without the disqualification of that athlete. A second infringement will result in the disqualification of that athlete, whether it is made in the same round or in another round of the same event. Okay, Barry. Okay, and in, in, in the case of relay races, any second step? as described in this rule by an athlete who is a member of the team, regardless of whether committed by the same or different athletes, will result in disqualification of the team, whether it happens 
in the same round or another round of the same event. So basically, in an individual event, it's the same athlete. In a team event, it can be any one of those athletes. So if you had somebody in the heat put one foot on the line um, at um, on, on the bend, and then in the semi-final, another one of the runners in that team put a, a foot on the line uh, in the semi-final, the team will be disqualified because they will have an L against their team name and they will be disqualified. So what, what happens with the uh, initial one is the referee would, would uh, put onto the infringement form uh, a warning, but make sure that the administration and uh, competition director were advised that that they had been given that warning and an L should be placed beside either an individual athlete's name or the team. And that would carry through to the semi or carry straight through to the final, depending on what it is. There's, there's been a question in the text box asking, does this only apply to bends? I'm assuming it. <clears throat> well, it, it applies to bends mainly for uh, races in lanes. Yeah. But when you've got, when you, you'll you see in a minute in the photos, if you've got a, um, uh, a non-laned event, then uh, it can apply for people cutting the corner on a on a entry to a water jump or uh, going over the plinth um, in or going on to the inside of the track even in the straight so that that's where it comes in into play there so you've you've just got to uh, be aware that if you see a um, a, a one foot uh, uh, indiscretion that you make sure as an umpire you report it and then it's up to the referee to make the decision as to what happens. So that's the, the important thing with, with this new rule. So on the basis that there's only one step, say in a lane event, and of course it, it also applies to the 800 when it's run in lanes for the first 100 metres. If they put one foot on the, on the, on the line on their left, when they go uh, around that bend, even though the rest of the event is is in a um, a, a non-laned event, they will still get reported. Okay, and okay, so thirty-one point four one fourteen point four, no performance will be ratified where where an athlete has infringed rule seventeen point three unless in the cases covered by. 1743 and 4.4 of the technical rules, it's the first infringement in the event. So the only way that they can uh, uh, be not uh, disqualified is if, if it's only the one step. And then it says that, um, nor in the case of an individual event where an athlete has recorded a false start as allowed under section uh, rule 39.83, and they're to do with technical, uh, the combined events. So they have the two things. So just to show you um, the one step on the line, if the first three there, if they step on the line and their foot is still touching the line, then you will you would report it and circle touch. And then if the foot on the the last one on the right hand side, if the foot is completely in the in the actual lane, that means that it doesn't matter whether it's a first step, second step, whatever, they are disqualified. It's only when they put the foot on the line that they will be um, uh, given the benefit of the doubt, if you like. So if you go to the next one, Darren, um, there, there it is, the way we've got it now in the, in, the, um, in the rule book, in the infringement form. So even if you had five strides, we're still asking the umpires to write touch or circle touch or whole foot in inside lane so that the referee is quite clear as to what sort of touch or what sort of misdemeanor it was. So if you look at the second one, you can see the guy with the green shoes has just got his foot on the line. The, the guy with the red shoes has just got his foot on the line. They're okay. 
but the guy in the blue shoes is right in the lane, so he would be disqualified even with one foot. So, Barry, there is another question here. Um, I think we've got it answered there, but if in a relay, if runners one and three in the relay were on the bend, I'm assuming they both cause an infringement, that would mean the team would get DQ'd. Exactly, and it can happen, it can happen in uh, 400 that yeah. the same athlete does it up at the top bend and then does it on the on the bottom bend. You get two reports, that person is gone, yeah. even though it's only one step each time. Yeah. Okay, so non-laned events, same sort of thing. You look at that, Main, mainly this one will be, as you'll see in the next photo, uh, if you get knocked inside the, um, the, the uh, field of play, so you, you're, you're on the grassed area. So it's a one step. So that's the sort of thing that could happen if, if they lose momentum or whatever and they put one foot there, then they can go back on the track. That's fine. It's reported and it goes through as an L if they go through another event. But usually that'll be a straight final. So we, we wouldn't carry it through. But if that person, as we'll show in a minute, tries to get it, they're, they're boxed in and they try and get out of it by going um, further up and take, take two, three, four steps, then they will be disqualified. So a material advantage includes improving your position by any means, including removing themselves from a box position in the race by having stepped or run inside the inside edge of the track. The note specifically outlaws the practice of an athlete seeking to improve their position in races by moving on to the inside of the track. So whether intentionally or after being pushed or jostled there by another athlete to get out of a box position by running on the inside until clear. While normally running on the inside of lane one is in the straight as distinct from doing so on the bend would not lead to mandatory disqualification. The referee has the power to disqualify in their, dis in their discretion if this occurs and the athlete is advantaged, even if the initial reason for being there was a result of being pushed. In, other, in such cases, the athlete should take immediate steps to return to the track without seeking to gain any advantage. So if you think of the guy that was running the 10,000 metres from Australia at the Tokyo Olympics, he fell into the inside of the track. He was absolutely gone as he came in for the final, uh, into the final home straight. That would not necessarily be, we wouldn't um, disqualify him because he wasn't in control of his body. But if you did that and then you, even in the straight, and you tried to get a better position out of that, then you can be disqualified. Yeah, just two things about that, Barry. One is a, a really good example of that, apart from the one that Barry's mentioned, is if um, if you go back to the Sydney Olympics in the men's uh, two, uh, the men's 800 metres, there's a, a classic example of that. Although if you go onto uh, YouTube and see it now, of course, the uh, film's a bit more scratchy than it is now. But also it would be great if we had the luxury of... Uh, a number of umpires around the track because if uh, two umpires are in a similar position and they pick an athlete up, we've got to be convinced that they're still look the, the uh, both umpires are looking at the one athlete at that step. If it yeah. uh, once once they the referee has determined that through the umpires, well, you can make a decision. But if it's two different steps, that's where the disqualification comes in. So when a race is started in lines and then continues on uh, and continues not using separate lanes, those two rules apply accordingly to each part start of the race. When determining whether the exception of uh, 17.43 applies in such cases where some part of the foot or shoe is also to the left of the line, there is a requirement for at least some part of the outline of the athlete's shoe or foot to be touching the line. That is some contact with the line depicted by the outline of the relevant part of the shoe or uh, foot is required for the exception to apply. If this is not the case, then the exception does not apply. And quite often you can pick this up, especially if there's a, there's a concern and uh, the video, if you can watch it live stream or screen, stream, or if there's a available video that can clarify that cl fairly clearly. An all lane infringement should be tracked in the competition data systems, as Barry's already mentioned, to show in the start list and results. 
and we go back to the rule 25.4 of the competition rules for that symbol being a, that, that will appear in the next start list for uh, that athlete. And the carryover rule only applies to the same event and not the race of a different distance. I've already touched on that previously. Okay, hurdles, Barry. Okay. In addition, this is this is just adding to the rule. So this part was in the rule. So in addition, an athlete shall be disqualified if. Now, this is where there, there is a change. They knock down or displace any hurdle by hand, body, and now it's the front side of the lead lower limb. The front side of the lead lower limb means the front of the lead leg starting from the top of the thigh down to the end of the foot. So we've got to look at that. And so we've put in here the avoidance of doubt. The front of the lead leg does not include the sole or the heel of that foot. Because if you went to a jury and you said he came and he hit the, the hurdle like that with his heel or his foot, they could very easily turn around and say, oh, I was trying to jump it, sir. So any part of the heel or the, or the sole of the foot is not regarded as being part of the front lead leg. It's when they do it and they hit the top of the, of the, the, the leg or the, the, the foot, or they hit it with the thigh or the shin. So that's where, where that comes in. Steeplechase races, um, just talking about the distances and their, their, their change the wording. It used to be something to the effect of uh, you were not to put the hurdles uh, out until the athletes had passed. And so now they, those hurdles should not be placed until the athletes have entered the first lap. So they can't do that. So looking at it, it applies only when the water jump is located on the inside of the track. If the 3,000 metres and 2,000 metres steeple, 18 hurdles and five water jumps is conducted at the same time. With an outside water jump, no hurdles will be removed from the track. But if it's an inside water jump, all the hurdles need to be removed from the track. And after the first group of athletes, whether it's the 3,000 metres or the 2,000 metre athletes pass, all hurdles need to be replaced on the, on the track. So that's got to be something that you have to be aware of as an umpire. Yes, especially, especially yeah. when there's uh, smaller competitions or smaller fields and uh, there isn't sufficient. Quite often they will... Uh, it may be a decision by the competition director and management to run both together, as Barry's indicated. Okay. Is there any questions, Daniel, on track? Because we've, um, we're, we're going into now into the field events. And if anyone's got any questions that they, that they want uh, clarified from what we've covered in track, please let us know. At the moment, there's no more coming through. We've uh, answered them all so far. But if any do pop up, I'll um, mention them. Okay. Thanks. You can always do it at the end at the end anyway. All right. So field events. Now this one again is a change, and everybody who got especially schools, etc., have to be aware of it. It's 25.6, and it says in situations in a horizontal field events where there are more than eight athletes, only the eight athletes with the best valid performances are allowed any additional trials. So this is a situation where you've got more than eight athletes. And they have the first three trials, and then the top eight should then be given the, the next three trials. This requires an athlete to have a measured mark. So if you only had eight athletes, or uh, you can't, what they're saying here is um, you must have a mark on the paper that says that you have achieved a result. So you've, oops. Uh, so you've got a measure mark recovered from a fair jump or throw in at least one of the first three trials. So you've got to record something. You can't go in to this event uh, on to, to this event uh, with a no measure. So where less than eight athletes achieve such a valid performance, it's only those athletes who are allowed any additional trials, even though it will mean less than eight athletes proceeding. So that's where you've got more than eight athletes. If you, if you ended up, say you had 12 and you had five 
of them that got a no measure because they got three fouls, you only take seven into the, into the final rounds. Okay. It's important when seeding high jump and pole vault qualifying groups that the requirements of 25.10 and 25.16 are technical rules are both observed. And that is that the technical delegate and the ITO referee shall follow closely the progress of the qualifying rounds of the high jump and pole vault to ensure that on the one hand, the athletes must jump or indicate that they are passing as long as they are not eliminated under rule 26.2 of the technical rules until the qualifying standard has been reached, unless the number of athletes for the final has been reached as defined in 25.12 of the technical rules. And on the other hand, any tie between athletes and the overall standings in the two groups is resolved according to 26.8 of the technical rules. Close attention must also be kept to the, the application of 25.14 of the technical rules um, and to ensure that athletes do not unnecessarily continue in the competition. So basically what it's saying is if you've attained the qualifying standard, you then take no further part in the event until they take you to the final of the event. So, you know, if they set one, one, 180 as the, as the, um, the qualifying measure, once you have jumped over 180, you don't jump again. So that's that's what that's basically saying. And somebody was saying about what happens with with less than six or less than eight uh, competitors. The basic rule still stands that if you have less than six, uh, less than eight competitors, they are all entitled to uh, have three, uh, six rounds, if that is what is in your local rules. Okay, we turn to long jump now. So rule 30.1, an athlete fails if, 30.11, while they're taking off prior to the instant which they cease contact with a takeoff board or ground, break the vertical plane of the takeoff line with any part of their takeoff foot or shoe, whether running up or whether jumping or in the act of jumping. This, is the, this rule is to do with the uh, removal of the plasticine. So we've gone back to the eye level now for the uh, board judge to make a decision as to whether the uh, athlete has uh, gone, moved across the board at the instant they cease contact with the board. And uh, in many cases now, a number of states I'm aware in uh, Australia are using cameras to make that judgment to support them. So with the, again, with, we're talking at uh, continue on with the uh, general competition of throwing. The rim of the circle shall be made of uh, band steel, iron steel, or other suitable material, the top of which should be flush to the ground outside. It should be at least six millimetres thick, and the inside and the top of the rim shall be, shall be white. So this is the new uh, the rule there, the, uh, the whiteness of the top of the rim and the inside of it, and the ground surrounding the circle may be concrete, synthetic, asphalt, wood, or any other suitable material. Okay, again, with the trials, there is, uh, there is no restriction on how or from which direction an athlete may enter the circle, nor in the case of a shot put, is there any restriction or making contact with the stop board during this process. The relevant requirement is that once they're inside the circle, they must start from a stationary position and the stationary position is what the officials can see. We're not worried about the arms, as it's, it goes on there. We're not worried about the arms. It's just the uh, position of the feet. So that, that's the, uh, the green writing you find into the book. So, John, just a quick question here. I think they're just trying to clarify uh, one more time. If you have five athletes in a field event and one of them does not make a valid trial, does that athlete still go through for the last three attempts? No. They have to, as Barry's indicated, they have to have a valid attempt in the first three throws or the yep. first jumps. Yep. Okay, I'm just conscious of time now. So I've, I've basically paraphrased that one. So if we continue on, uh, it is should, should be a failure if an athlete, uh, a failure if a discus or the head of the hammer strikes the far side of the cage. So that's the left side for a right-hander and, and the... Uh, as they're facing the sector or a right side for a left-hander when facing the sector after the release of the implement. 
for the simple reason that if it hits that side, it would go out out of the sector anyway. So it's not considered a failure if the discus or any part of the hammer strikes the near side of the cage, the right hand for the right side for right hander and the same for the left hander after the relief of the implement then lands within the landing sector within outside the li limits of the cage provided no other rule is infringed including the, ru the rule there. So Gary Barry you'd like to explain this diagram? Yeah okay the, you want to put that diagram up thanks Darren. Okay the limits of the cage shall be the boundary so if you look at the uh, on there, there's an orange line. <clears throat> the story is that if you uh, are a right-hander and you hit the cage on the right-hand side and it goes over the orange line, you can measure it. If it's on this, uh, if it's on the circle side of the orange line, it's not measured. So it's then up to the athlete to decide whether they will allow that measure to. Uh, be recorded or not, because they can, of course, create a foul by tipping the, the top of the, the rim. So basically, that's just explaining it. And as John said, if you look at those, um, the um, sector lines there, if somebody is a right-hander and pulls it and it touches the left-hand side, uh, the implement hits the left-hand side, it would have been going out anyway. So it'll be a foul. All right. And the last one we're going to look at is race walking. And that's just telling you that there are two new uh, events and they are 35 kilometres, which of course is the road racing distance and 35,000 metres, which is the track distance. And there's, there's the times for the penalty, uh, for the penalty zone. So if you're doing a, a 35k uh, walk outside, if you go into the penalty zone because you've had three red cards, you'll be in there for three and a half minutes. So there are all the times for the penalty zones. Okay. And the other thing that has come out of this is that um, in all other competitions, in race walking, excluding competitions included in the World Athletics Series or the Athletics Program in the Olympic Games, Chief Judge Moody, after the end of the event, shall report to the referee the identification of all athletes disqualified under Rules uh, 54.4.1, which is the Chief Judge's role, 54.7.1, which is disqualification by three red cards, and 54.75, which is the additional red card. So if they um, are sent or going towards the penalty area and they get a, a fourth red card, then they are disqualified from the event. They don't have to go into the penalty zone. Of the tech, and so this is of the technical rules by indicating a bit of identification at the time of the notification of the offences, and the same shall be done for all athletes who receive red cards. Okay. I think that, sir, is about it. Yep. So if there's any questions, please ask. Yeah, while you're thinking about the question, what we've tried to do is highlighted the uh, most obvious rules that we feel that uh, will, will apply to us on the track. Obviously, once you get the book, uh, whether you can read it online or once, once the book arrives, when it does arrive, you'll be able to get uh, further clarification. All we're doing is highlighting to make drawing your attention to these uh, new rules. Yeah, one of, one of the things I will mention, guys, I don't know whether anybody's seen it, but there's a guy in New Zealand who has put together a, um, a phone app that can, or an app that can be loaded onto your phone. Uh, at, at the moment, it's only Apple, so iPods, phones, or iPads. And for $1.49, you can get the WA rules uh, on your phone and it is quite good because it, it's broken up into competition rules it's broken up into track rules and specialty so you'd all the jump rules are together so you could just look at it if if uh, you don't get the the rule book this is one that you could could use and it's under athletic athletic rule book so if you look that up you can get get that and they're going to do an android one so and 
also said that they were going to do it for the WPA and all other rule books in time. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, John and Barry, and for staying pretty much to time and getting through a quite a bit of information. So we 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 have hit just past eight o'clock, but if there are uh, quickly any any questions, I don't know, Daniel, if you've seen any more come up in the chat box at this stage, but if there are any final questions before we do conclude the uh, this 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 seminar, uh, Daniel, anything else? There is, there is one more. It's just who's the onus on for checking shoes that are correct. Um, athletes declaration or the start team, TIC, et cetera. So they just want to know who is responsible for checking that the shoes are uh, according to the rules. Okay, well, it start, obviously it starts in the call room, but prior to competition, the, uh, prior to uh, reporting the call room, the athletes should have already nominated what sort of shoe they're, being, they're going to use. And obviously the call room will have the various measuring implements to measure the thickness. And also they'll have that fortnightly uh, list that is put out by World Athletics. The only time a referee would be involved in it would be if they have any concern. Or they, they get a protest. They're correct. And it, again, the thing is, it's under 20s and opens. At a school, school carnival, it shouldn't, shouldn't be entertained because they've already said, as we mentioned before, AA has already said that they're the only ones they're going to look at. We get... At school, I've, I've had it where somebody says, oh, that, that shoe is, um, is not legal. Well, as, an, as a referee at the time, I don't have calipers with me or anything like that. So at a school level, unless there is a real advantage, it has to really go to a jury um, to, if there's a problem with it, it has to go up to competition management. We can't deal with it there and then on the track. All right. Anything else there, Daniel, at all at this stage? Because we do, um, we do, we will need to wrap up pretty soon. Yeah, something that's just about a contact for the rule book in New Zealand, but I'm sure we can work that out after the okay. meeting. Yeah, athletics rule book. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, John and Barry. Um, a, a very, as I said, a lot of information to fit into a short time. So, so, so well done. Um, and thank you to everybody who has attended th this evening. Um, as I said, we had people from all over Australia and um, it was great that you took the time to be here. And I hope you found this, the, the, uh, this workshop or this seminar, as, as, as we'll call it, um, useful. Um, now, what I'm going to do now, um, now for those people who are, are watching the recording, I am going to stop the recording. So thank you very much for, for viewing this and, and we do hope that you've enjoyed it.